I'm going to be talking this morning. Um, last week we celebrated the resurrection of Jesus. Kant mentioned it a little bit in this morning. And I was just thinking about this week, the disciples, the followers of Jesus. So they've seen him now. He's resurrected. They've spent time with him. It's been absolutely amazing. And now he goes. He goes back to the Father and the, the, like, the commanders go wait for the Holy Spirit, you know, so they all get together and they wait. Holy Spirit comes. Some of the Sha one Peter stands up and he preaches and a whole bunch of people come to God and they all walk together and there's amazing miracles that happens. And this is all, but they were moving. <laughs> and, and so it's exciting. It, it's all happening. It feels like this message that Jesus brought is alive and it's moving. But what follows very closely is the persecution. And what the persecution does is it scatters the disciples. So they end up scattered everywhere. Some alone, some one or two together, some families. But there's a moment of scattering that happens. And there's a moment of alone that happens. I don't know if you've gone in your life at any stage to your alone moment where you feel alone. It feels like no one's around you. No one's ever been through what you've gone through. And no one will ever understand what you're going through. This is like I'm alone. And this is what I want to share about this morning is those spaces where we're alone, our personal space with God in those moments. It's easy when we're all here worshiping God on a Sunday all together, brothers and sisters, and it's like, praise God. But some of us walk out of here and go to an office where everyone is an unbeliever and you face great persecution and it's hard. Some of, you, some of us go back to your home where there's no believers in the home and you're the only believer. Maybe it's students back on campus, and being a believer is not the great, greatest thing ever. And so there's this sense of being alone. And I want to talk about that this morning, and I want to use the story of Elijah the prophet. So Elijah was a prophet in a time where kings weren't really following God. They were doing their own thing. They were on their own missions, doing their own thing. And God spoke to him, so I'm going to introduce him a little bit because there's been some amazing thing that happens in his life. And God speaks to him and tells him to go tell the king that, listen, there's a big drought coming. There'll be no water. So he goes and tells him. And then God tells him, go hide away in a cave or in a whatever. Go hide away. I'll provide for you. He goes, he hides away. And then he says, listen, you need to move away from there because there's no more provision there. Go to this town. And he goes to the town and, and God provides for him a family. And while he's there, there's just amazing miracles that happen. It's in 1 Kings. I'd encourage you to go read the stories. It is absolutely amazing. And I won't do it justice if I tell it. But the story I want to tell is a story about a moment where Elijah, just like God calls Elijah to go speak to the king who wants to kill him because he's a prophet of God. And he tells him, go present yourself to the king. And so that's from that moment of out the cave, in the new, he's kind of in hiding. And the word of God came to Elijah, go and present yourself to Ahab, and I will send rain on the land. So they're, desperate, they're in desperate need of rain. Everything's dried up. It's, they need rain. And so the, the command to Elijah is go and present yourself to the king who wants to kill you because you're a prophet of God. And then I'll give rain. It's like sometimes we, th we feel like, you know, yeah, it was easy. Like all he had to do was just go to the king and present himself to the king and rain would come. But if we look at the back of the story, that king, he's hiding because that very king and all the other kings have set up together to take out his life. What does he do? He goes. At that, same st at that same stage, Ahab and Obadiah. So Obadiah was palace administrator. So if you look at like business place, one of the hot shots up at the top, very close to the big boss. He was a believer. He was, Obadiah was a devout believer in the Lord. So there we find a situation of a man who's a devout belie um, believer in the Lord, who's serving Somebody who wants to kill the prophets of the Lord and wants nothing to do with the Lord. They set out because they need food. There's a famine, there's no food, and so they set out to fetch some food for the animals because they don't want to have to kill the animals. So they go, Abadiah, Lord, Ahab, not God, king, they go on their separate way. Abadiah comes, and while he's looking, he comes across Elijah. And Elijah is, tells him, listen, Take me to your master. <laughs> and he's like, whoa, 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 whoa. Have you not heard? Do you not know what's going on here? Like, you, we, we can't do that. First of all, he tells him a long story. Everyone's looking for you. 
nobody's found you, and we've had to swear that we didn't find you. So now if I go back to him, and I say, listen, I'll find him, I'm in threat of death. And what if you disappear again? You've disappeared for so many years. What if I go tell him, and then I come back and you're gone? And he's like, no, no, I'll be there. But Obadiah slips in his little story, his little God story in there. Like sometimes, you know, we're so proud and we so, and he's like, did you not hear what I did? I hid a hundred prophets of God in two caves and I fed them. So like I'm, I'm in threat of dying myself. And then now if I come with that story and you're not there, I'll definitely be killed. And Elijah's like, no, it's fine. Just go fetch him. So he goes, fetches him, comes back. And when Ahab arrives, the first thing he does, he basically tunes Elijah. He's like, yo, you the troublemaker of Israel. So obviously, we must remember, he wants to kill him. So he's like, oh, Elijah, is that you? Is that the troublemaker of Israel? And so he's like, no, no, I'm not the troublemaker. You, your fathers and your families have stopped following God, have stopped obeying his command. You're calling me a troublemaker. You're the one who's causing trouble because you're not following the commands of God, you f- you're following the bowls, whatever, the gods, the ad- idols, the other gods, the w- whatever you've made for yourself, whatever the nations and the world is worshiping. You've decided you're going to bring that on board, push God's command aside, and live by those things rather. So, and a prophet at that stage had authority. So, like he was known and he, he had authority, so he could speak. So he asked the king, he said, listen... Call all the people of Israel. Bring everyone here. We need to have a bit of a meeting. Bring everyone here and we'll talk. All gather together so the word goes out to all the people of Israel. They presented and Elijah goes before everyone and he says, How long will you waver between two opinions? If the Lord is God, follow him. If Baal is God, follow him. So you'd think, like the whole of Israel, everyone's there now. He's talking, he's addressing them. It's quite a serious point. Listen, what do you believe in? And stand up and follow whatever you're believing in. I would think that at that stage, whatever you're believing in, you're like, I'm for Jesus, I'm for Jesus, you know, whoever, whatever you're at for, you're shouting that. Everyone. But the people said nothing. Nothing. Not go bowl, go bowl, or go God, go God, or go whatever. Just nothing. It was quiet. And then Elijah finds this opportunity and he says, I am the only one of the Lord's prophets left. I'm the only one. I stand here and I'm alone. You've got 450 prophets of Baal, 400 400 prophets, some other, whatever. You've got those big teams, worshippers of idols. Let's do something. And he kind of throws a little challenge out there. And he says, listen, we're going to both kill a bull. We're going to make woods and put the bull on the wood bits and pieces. And we're not going to light it up. Basically a sacrifice to the gods. We're not going to light it up. And we're going to each call to our gods. And whichever consumes the sacrifice will be God. Everyone's like, fair deal. What you say is good. Finally, they open their mouths. What you say is good. Let's do this thing. Actually, they're probably sitting in a space where they're not even too sure themselves where they stand. All this nonsense has has come along. There's been a a, a diversity in opinions and and things that they are singing and seeing, and everything's a little bit blurry. So this moment will bring something clear in their minds. Because if Baal comes and does, then he's God. But if God comes, the Lord, our God, the God of Israel comes and burns, then he is God for sure. And so they set up. Put everything. Elijah's like, you guys go first. Choose whatever bull you want. Do whatever. You have it. You guys go first. And they go. And they start shouting, you know, Baal answer us. And they shout all sorts of stuff. And nothing happens. They dance around. And Elijah began to actually chirp them a little bit. I think he's quite cheeky at that moment. I don't know whether I was going to share it or not. I wouldn't do that. Um, but it's a man of God, and he did it. He starts chirping. He's like, well, shout louder. Surely he's God. Perhaps he's in deep thoughts or busy. Or maybe he's traveling, you know. <laughs> maybe he's sleeping. He needs to be awakened. 
And so they do. They get obviously a bit frustrated with all that. And so they shout louder. They go for it. They start slashing themselves with swords and spears, as were their custom, until their blood flowed. So now you, we kind of see a little picture of actually what worshipping those bowls and those idols leads you to. I think often we forgot, we forget God wants us to be obedient to His command because His commands are good for us. And so here we find a people that have walked astray from God and that are willing to slash themselves and bleed in order to call on some dead gods. Like, it's obvious, like, how can that be good? Like, why would you be willing to, to obey those kind of commands where you need to cut yourself and bleed and, and dance and call upon dead, dead gods, statues and whatever, when there's a God who's got good commands for you, good things that are helpful for your life? I've gone astray a little bit there. Sorry. So they do all that. Nothing happens. This is what the word says. But there was no response. No one answered. No one paid any attention. Nothing happened. All this Rad Maharal, all this dancing, all this blood, all this nonsense, 450 with all the belief, all that. Nothing happened. It was dead. Then Elijah said to all the people, come here. He began by repairing the altar. So they had broken down the altar. So he repairs the altar. He takes 12 stones that represent um, just the people of God. I'm not going to go into details with that. With those 12 stones, he built an altar. He digs a trench around the altar, a nice deep, deep trench around the altar. Puts the wood, puts the bits and pieces of wood. And then you would think that, okay, now it's level ground, you know. They had their chance. They did their thing. He's done now. Dug the trench. It's before God. And then he calls them and he says, listen, bring water. Pour water on the whole thing. So you're like, oh, wow, like you're quite sure of your God, eh? You're pouring water on that. He's like, no, do it again. And do it a third time, three times, until the trench around is filled up with water. There is no ways but God that this can be lit on fire. Then Elijah steps forward and he prays this beautiful prayer. Lord, the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Israel, let it be known today that you are God in Israel and that I am your servant and have done all these things at your command. Answer me, Lord, answer me. So these people will know that you, Lord, are God. And that you are turning their hearts back again. And that moment, everything settles down. And this beautiful prayer goes out for a people that are broken, slashing themselves to a dead God, to turn their hearts back to the true living God who cares about them. Then the fire of the Lord fell and burnt up the sacrifice. It could have ended there. And that would have been already absolutely amazing. But God is the almighty God. It also burnt up the wood, the stones, the soil, and it took out all the water in the trench around. The mighty power of God came down. It happened when everyone saw that. They all bowed down and declared the Lord is God. The Lord is God. It takes sometimes radical, crazy moments like that. And I wonder why. Uh, as a people of God, it feels like we're always going on those weird journeys where we go like we end, end, end up in those places where we're slashing ourselves. For what? When he's got a good command for a, a people that he loves and he's done everything for them. So disobedience is what led the people away from God. They wanted to do their own thing. They were um, led astray, got caught up in the things of the world. Disobedience leads to sin that will end up in death. They were willing to do it. But God always creates a way for redemption, repentance, and turning away. God's calling was simple. The calling was to obey His command. He didn't ask anything extravagant or extraordinary. He had a beautiful command for His people to make sure that they were close to Him and that they would be protected by Him. But they wanted to do their own thing. 
Elijah listened to God and was obedient. And God used Elijah to turn the hearts of his people, to turn the hearts of the Israelite people, the Israelite nation, back to him. Obeying God is regardless of what everyone else is doing. So Elijah finds himself there, standing, saying, you know, I'm alone. This is me. There's no one else obeying the commands of God. This is me. It's, it's regardless. You might find yourself in that same position. We're like, well, everyone's just doing that. Like, well, like, everyone is just doing that. Like, I, I might as well just do it as well. It's, that's not being obedient to God. Being obedient to God is doing what God has asked you to do. And sometimes it's going against what everyone else is doing. Obadiah served God, although his master didn't. I think that's a beautiful example as well. Because sometimes you're like, well, you, know, you don't understand how hard it is to be in that business with this boss who doesn't believe. And like, it's constant. It's, it's so much easier for me just to let go. Like at home, I can, I, in, in home I worship God. But at work, is it fine if I just do whatever they do? Like I, I don't feel like, and that's what he was saying. You need to make up your mind. Is it this God or is it the almighty God? You choose, but you need to choose. Obedience can be lonely. Elijah was alone, the last prophet left. But it didn't change who God was. The fact that you're alone doesn't change who God is. It doesn't change his command. Elijah's a great example for me of how he didn't get phased by all of that. I look at him in that situation and I would have been a little bit intimidated. There's, it's everyone, the whole nation. I'm standing there alone. It's like he wasn't phased at all. And I look back and I'm like, like wow, what was the story that he wasn't phased? He relied on God constantly. If you look at the stories before, as God speaks, he's not like, what if, but this king is looking for me, I might die, this or that. God speaks, he moves and does what God says. And then he finds himself in that next spot, doesn't complain, doesn't do anything, he waits for God to speak again. And then he moves. And I'm like, I wonder how many times maybe in my life God spoke to me and I moved and then I, I was like, okay, well, I can't hear him. Maybe, maybe if I go there or maybe if I do that or maybe if I, then he'll speak. He waited, God spoke, and he moved. And it, like, it should be exactly the same. And every time he spoke and then he moved, God provided in amazing ways, radical ways. The, the stories are absolutely incredible. But Elijah wasn't completely alone. Because we know with Obadiah, he was a follower as well, and he was right there. And I think, what, like, what in that moment, you know, there you start, yeah, like you stand, you've just spoken to Elijah, you've told him that you're also a believer. He stands in, he's like, okay, you need to choose. And you're sitting there, you're like in the front row, you've got the king next to you, he's like, if he knows, he'll kill you. And like, what do I do now? What do I do now? What do I do now? It's like, okay, are you going to talk or are you going to say something? What about him? He was a believer, he was there. So Elijah wasn't alone. What about the hundred prophets that Abadiah rescued, saved in the cave? They were also going through the same thing. They were looked like they wanted to, people wanted the kings wanted to kill them, so they wanted to hide away. And so in that situation, Elijah was alone, maybe in that situation. But what he was facing, he wasn't facing it alone. Lots of other people around were also facing it. And sometimes in our lives we don't realize it, but we're going through things that are really hard. Again, I take the example of the business. We had the privilege this week to go pray in a business environment. It was really good. So maybe that's why it keeps on coming back. And all your business um, ladies and gents out there, we are praying for you guys and for the business places. But what if that is it? You know, you're feeling alone there. You're in that place and it's heavy and stuff. But what if the building underneath or next door, someone is facing exactly the same thing. They're alone in that environment. Why don't we begin praying for one another? Why don't we begin walking with one another and knowing and understanding that I might be alone in here, in this situation, but there's surely someone else going through the same thing. And when we look at the story of Jesus, he was the real one alone. We've still got God. He's by our side. He's with us. Jesus was completely alone. Complete separation from the Father as he dressed himself with our sins to pay the price with love for our lives. There he was, his best friends, just before going to the cross. Stay awake with me. Please stay awake with me. Pray with me. Fast asleep. Maybe that's you this morning. You feel alone because you've been betrayed by your best friends. You know, you've asked them, you've told them, listen, this is one of those moments. I need you. And it's like, nowhere to be seen. 
go there and knock on the door again. Please, like, I really need you. Do you understand? Nothing. And you're feeling really alone. God is with you. Jesus knows exactly what you're feeling because you went through it for each and every one of us. But I think what's important is what has God called us to? If we're feeling alone, it's one thing. But if God has called us to the cave, like Elijah, you know, he called him. He was alone there. If God has called you to that space, like if we keep on finding our strength and our identity and the calling that God has called us, we should be secure and safe in it. He's gonna, there's going to be a move. There's going to be the next step. And we know that he is with us. My other point is don't be quiet. When Elijah challenged everyone, just it, it went dead quiet. And so I'm not saying go argue. You know, we, we are in a generation where it's out there and just argue everyone. Like the internet is loads of that. You put your, your point of view out there and the other one smashes it and, and it's a big war field. No, I'm, I'm not talking about that. But it's about in these times where we stand in a space where things are said that we disagree with completely. It doesn't go with our belief. And we feel like, well, you know, what do we do now? It's like, well, they, they won't understand me. Let's just let it pass, you know. But I feel like by, say, by doing that, we, we are agreeing with, because it, we're not disagreeing. And so you might be saying, yeah, I said, but you're not agreeing. But, but if that's what's going on in the conversation, and it just carries on, they were like, well, we're chatting. Sid was there. He didn't mention anything about that. It must be absolutely okay. It must be part of his journey as well, and they must fully understand. I'm going to share a little bit, example about that. So I've been added to a WhatsApp group with people that I've got like high respect for. For me, they're like the heroes, you know. And I've had the privilege of being invited in one of those like WhatsApp groups where I'm like, yeah, I'm you know, I made it in that group. This is so cool. Take some big dif- decisions. It's people that I feel are of influence in the community around us, and and the one morning. And there was a message that went out was, that was completely out of place. Uh, I read it and I was like, what? Like, I can't believe this has been said. But I was like, like, you know, it's typical. The Christian guy is going to like start chirping and start an argument and all that. I'm like, uh, just leave it. But it ate at me. It ate at me. It ate at me the whole day. It was constantly in my mind and I was praying and I was wrestling with it. And I was like, because I didn't want to start an argument. What, what's a platform? The best argument you can have is coffee around a table with someone one on one. If you start opening it up to 10, 15 people in a WhatsApp group, it's going to be disastrous. So I was like, no, I can't do that. I can't do that. And about two o'clock in the afternoon, I was like, no, uh, uh, this is not on. So either I remove myself, move from the group, you know, said uh, left. <laughs> Which kind of puts a clear message out there. I think everyone will understand. But I thought that's a little bit cowardly, you know. Like, like uh, I feel like God can give me the grace and love and humility to share my stand on this point. Where, well, if they don't respect me, that's fine. Then they can remove me, you know. Um, and so I did. I started typing. And obviously, when you type on WhatsApp, you can see Sid is typing. So I, I take a bit of time to type. <laughs> Get a phone call from one of the guys on that group. It's like, Sid said, I see you typing. Yeah. He's like, don't do it. (laughs) It's not worth it. I said, no, explain. He's like, no, you know, I I know what you're going to say. I agree with you. You don't need to go like on a battle there. It's not the right place and the right everything. So I was like, oh, one person, you know, out of the 15, at least there's one guy he like, he knows what's going on. So I explained to him, I said, listen, I'm I'm not uh, like I'm going to, Treat it with respect, but I don't want everyone else to think and believe, or I don't want to assume that everyone else thinks that I'm not okay with it, or I don't want to think that people think that I'm okay with it. So I, I need to voice myself, and I'm, this is what I'm going to say. And he was like, oh, okay, okay, if you want to, you can, like, it's fine. So I went and sent my message with grace, with love, starting by saying that I acknowledge him as a person, I respect him as a person, but the point of view, I will not... I, I, I won't take, like, I, I won't be part of that. And I, like, I'm really sorry. And I fully understand, you know, if, if, like, if it means I need to be removed or I don't, like, whatever. I want to say I'm sorry, but I need to voice myself. I can't be on this group and think that you guys think that I'm okay with this. There's no ways. Straight away, the, the guy who sent the message is back at it. <laughs> so I answer, 
I hope you understand. Shed it with love. And that was it. Uh, that was my last message out. Turns out, um, this was a group of probably about 14 people. Um, there were 13 people <laughs> that agreed, but no one voiced it. Everyone stayed quiet. That person was removed from the group the next morning. <laughs> Thank you, Jesus. <laughs> no, shame. I, th- I think there's, you know, there's space to talk, and, and we all go through different things. But I think, so my point is, let, let us not be a people who's quiet. You know, there's a space. And obviously, I'm not saying go argue every point and, and go, like, I'm, that's not what I'm saying at all. But I'm saying, don't be quiet in a space where you should take a stand for what is truthful and righteous. Step out. What, whatever the cost may be, it's worth it. Because there might be one other person there that's in between and that hasn't made, them, made up their mind and hasn't put up their mind on, on what is, you know, righteous. So they're like, well, you know, well, like, there's 15 people here. No, everybody's agreeing with this. Well, I don't feel it, but maybe, maybe they're right. You know, they're people of influence. They're like you know, the great guys in the community. Maybe I need to move a little bit as well and change my thinking a bit. And so don't be scared to voice the truths of God. Ephesians 5.14 is my closing. Follow God's example, therefore, as dearly loved children, and walk in the way of love, just as Christ loved us and gave himself up for us as a fragrant offering and sacrifice to God. But among you, there must, be, there must not be even a hint of sexual immorality or of any kind of impurity, or of greed. Because these are improper for God's holy people. Nor should there be obscenity, foolish talk, coarse joking, which are out of place, but rather thanksgiving. So he addresses like a few things there. And like same thing, I look at the environments, and sometimes you know, you're just with friends, and there's a joke that comes out, and you're like, it's not the best joke, you know, but... Like, I'm, you know, it's okay. Like, I'm sure, and, and I'm not saying go challenge everything, but I'm saying make sure that people know what the truths and the righteousness of God is and don't take part in things that are unrighteous. Don't take part in darkness. You are children of light. We are children of light. Why are we flirting with darkness? Like, don't be scared to say, listen, uh, I understand you guys might find it funny. I don't find it funny. I find it a little bit offensive. Now, um, like if you're allowed to voice your opinion on a joke that actually is offensive, like I should be allowed just to say, and I respect you, and it's great. You guys can carry on laughing, but, but I want to make sure that you guys know around the table here that that really hurts me. And, and it's okay. You can carry on, but it doesn't go with what I believe. It doesn't go with what I stand for. For of this you can be sure, no immoral, impure, or greedy person has any inheritance in the kingdom of God. And then it's, it says in 6, Let no one deceive you with empty words. For because of such things, I'm going to read it in the NL, NLT version, sorry, just because it just really spoke to me when I read it here. Yeah. Don't be fooled. By those who try to excuse these sins, for the anger of God will fall on all who disobey Him. Don't be fooled by those who try to excuse those sins. And we are. Like people try to bring down sin. No, it's not that bad, you know. Everyone's doing it. It's not as bad as this. It's just this. Like, like it's okay. And, and we get caught up in that dance. Don't be fooled by those making excuses. The anger of God will fall on anyone who disobeys Him. And then it comes back to that verse a little bit further down, verse 10. Carefully determine what pleases the Lord. I think if anything this morning we can take home is those words. Carefully determine what pleases the Lord. And obey what He's saying. Be obedient. What is God asking me to do? What is going to please God in this situation, in this moment? Not please the crowds, 
not please the movement that are going on and the big hype topics at the moment, but what will please God right now? And that takes spending time with God. That takes trusting God. That takes being obedient to God step by step. But, um, okay, then he, he speaks about, you know, like what people do. Don't talk about what people do. And I think that's like super, have nothing to do with fruitless deeds of darkness, but rather expose them. It is shameful even to mention what the disobedient do in secret. But everything exposed by the light becomes visible, and everything that is illuminated becomes a light. This is what is said. Wake up, sleeper, rise from the dead, and Christ will shine on you. And it's exactly that same thing. You know, if nobody's, if we are meant to be light and darkness, and we're sitting in situations that are darkness, and we're not sharing the light, those dark areas will never come to light. Like, like, like sometimes we, we think that like what suddenly is just going to pop up. It's going to take expressing ourselves. It's going to take shining our light. It's going to take representing Christ. It's going to be hard, 100%. We're going to feel alone, 100%. God knows each and every one of those feelings and those thoughts, and he's right there with us. He can come at any stage, almighty, like fire down, and consume everything that needs to be consumed. Let's put aside the things of the world and live in a godly way. Would you stand with me as I close and pray, please? Lord, we thank you for just your grace upon us, Lord. We thank you for your presence here with us this morning, Lord. We thank you for your word, Lord. Thank you, Lord, for just your incredible faithfulness, Lord. And Lord, we, we pray, Lord, that if there's any areas, Lord, that we've been disobedient, Lord, would you reveal them to us, Lord? Every area, Lord, that maybe we've just become complacent with, Lord. We've just, it's just, we've tagged it along in our journey, Lord. We've been fooled by talks that it's absolutely okay, Lord. I pray, Holy Spirit, that you would reveal them to us, Lord. And I pray, Lord, that as the king that read your laws and went against it, Lord, tore his clothes, Lord, and repented and ran to you, Lord, that we would be the same, Lord, quick to repent, Lord, quick to turn back to you, Lord. I pray, Lord, that you would turn our hearts in the same way that you turned the hearts of the Israelite nation, Lord, at at that beautiful challenge, Lord. I thank you, Lord, for our lives, Lord, and the calling where you've called us, Lord, and I pray, Lord, that we wouldn't be a people that is quiet, Lord. I pray, Lord, that we would shine your light, Lord. I thank you for wisdom in how we speak, Lord. I thank you that you would fill us with humility and love to share your powerful gospel and your great truth and righteousness, my God. I thank you, Lord, that we would be the light that you have called us to be, my God. And I pray, Lord, that as we, as we go from here, Lord, I pray for anyone who's maybe feeling alone during this time, Lord, that they would feel the power of your calling upon them, Lord, that they would know that you are with them, my God. I thank you, Lord, for the privilege of being able to repent and be forgiven because of the mighty cross, Lord. And Just pray, Lord, that as we go from here, Lord, you would search our hearts, Lord. Pray that you would transform us, Lord, that you would fill us, Holy Spirit, and that we would live lives worthy of your calling, my God. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Amen. Thank you so much. There's tea and coffee. There's, if you want to read up on the conference, if you want to help in any way, at the back table, you can write down names. Be blessed and have a good week.